Hello! Hi! Hi. That's a good start. Yeah. yeah. So we're Zach and Kelly Wienersmith, and we wrote a book called Soonish: Ten Emerging Technologies That'll Improve and or Ruin Everything. Uh, I'm a parasitologist. I study parasites that manipulate the behavior of their hosts, uh, and I work for Rice University. And I draw, I draw comics and stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we decided to write a book on technology, and in 2011, a group of policy students at Hamilton College wrote a book called... Uh, oh, it was a paper. It? A paper, sorry, called Are Talking Heads Blowing Hot Air? And essentially, they were looking at the predictive abilities of 26 really popular pundits that were on lots of TV shows. And these pundits ranged from being mostly right to mostly wrong, but importantly, they all still had their jobs. And so we were like, we should write a book about tech, <laughs> where like it doesn't matter if we're right or wrong, because apparently that doesn't impact your ability to have a job. Yeah. Uh, but actually, we're, we're not really interested in this book in making predictions, because we think that what's interesting isn't necessarily figuring out how many years out a technology is, so much as talking about what the amazing challenges that people are working on right now are. And so we talk a lot more about the technical hurdles that still need to be overcome. And then we talk a little bit about how these technologies could make everything awesome, but also maybe horrible. And so we give you a little bit of a taste of one of the chapters in the book and a little bit uh, on one of the nota benes. Uh, what uh -oh. did you want to say? Yeah. Oh, OK. Uh, so the 10 topics we cover in the book, let's see if I can remember them all, are uh, cheap access to space, asteroid mining, fusion, brain-computer interfaces, bioprinting, augmented reality, um, robotic construction, programmable matter, BCI, brain-computer interfaces. I thought I said that already. And then bioprinting. And bioprinting. Didn't I say bioprinting? <laughs> yeah, I said both of those already. So we're still but at eight now, huh? That, that's fine. <laughs> anyway, buy the book. You'll see, you'll find out the rest. Uh, that's our pitch. Um, and, and at the end of a lot of the chapters, we like we uncovered all sorts of crazy stuff while we were doing the research for this book, and that's like a ton, of, a big part of why this book was so much fun to write. And so at the end of some of the chapters, we talk about these weird things that we encountered, uh, and we include these in our nota benes. And so we're going to discuss one of the nota benes that yeah. we uh, wrote in the book as well. It's not this one, but this is the whole not, thing. But th this was really awesome. And we got to talk to this, we got to talk to so many amazing people while doing this book. Uh, but anyway, so we, uh, we've been told that talking, instead of talking about cheap access to space, programmable matter would probably go over best with this audience, so we're doing the programmable matter chapter. Uh, so how about you start? Oh, I'll start. OK, sure. Um, so I feel like I need to not talk as much because it's Google, so I don't need to explain like what are, what are computers, I guess, <laughs> right? You all know about those? Um, yeah, so uh, the idea in general with programmable matter uh, is that you, in the same way that a computer is universal, you can make stuff that's universal. Um, and there are a lot of different approaches to how you might do that. I think we go through a couple of them here. The books are a lot more extensive. But when we say programmable matter, we're kind of condensing together a bunch of different fields like self-reconfiguring matter. There's a, there's a book called Morphogenetic Engineering, and I wish they'd gone with that. That was really cool. Um, but just stuff that can reconfigure itself uh, in different ways. So we're going to go through a few ways. Um, <laughs> it's a little wordy. Um, so this is um, my drawing of Skylar Tibbetts. Skylar Tibbetts is a guy at MIT. He does what he calls 4D printing, uh, which just means it's, it's 3D printing, but the stuff does more once it's printed. So um, there are a bunch of examples of this, but, but the one we thought was cute was um, was he made this straw. And it's just made so that the joints are printed so that when they intake water, they bend in a way that you quote unquote program into the material. So he made one where you program it, where you program it so you drop the stick in water and it spells out MIT because he's at MIT. But what's cute about that, we thought, is you could you could like really creep people out if they didn't know what it was. Um, <laughs> like you could make programmable spaghetti and it just says like find help or something. Or I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's sort of like uh, oh, there's, there's another one that's theoretically more functional. I don't. I don't think the, the, the wood thing was his, right? That was... Um, right. Yeah, so there's this one project where it was essentially wood that was designed to respond to humidity. Uh, and so it was like you can give a building basically pores so that they can open out or close up depending on ambient conditions. Um, so there are a couple of projects working on that. And in, in addition to just kind of looking awesome, uh, you have the potential for a, a zero or low energy environmental regulation mechanism. Uh, but mostly it looks really cool. It looks like you're looking at like a giant dead alien. Uh, so that's neat. 
Um, well, so oh, so one one of the things uh, that that Skylar Tibbetts pointed out was that the hard thing about this technology right now is that there isn't really good software written that programs <coughs> in information about joints and how they respond to environmental conditions. Mm -hmm. And I know you guys have like 20% of time that you get to spend on anything else. So <laughs> FYI. <laughs> Sure, so then uh, the next category that we talked about are origami robots, and we got really excited about origami and robots, and so we had this guy, Jason Koo, uh, design an origami, uh, what design? Robot. Robot, well, okay, <laughs> robot, but, but anyway, so, so if you're interested in our origami robot, you can download the design uh, here, and you can see our origami robot. So origami, <clears throat> You know, I'm sure you're all familiar with origami. You have a sheet of paper, and you follow like some rules for how you fold it, and you make it be this different shape. Well, if you also put actuators in there, you can get the paper to fold itself so that you don't have to do it on your own, right? Because why spend the time doing that? It's really frustrating. I know some people think it's beautiful. <laughs> That's probably not me. Uh, uh. And so anyway, you can put these actuators in there, and you can get them. Be with these actuators, you can get the robots to like walk around and pick stuff up and do all sorts of crazy stuff. What were you going to say? No. Oh, OK. So uh, one of the cool things that they're working on getting these robots to do is, uh, is have medical applications. So Dr. Daniela Roos at MIT made this origami robot out of sausage casing. And you essentially fold it up. You stick it in ice. The person swallows the ice, and then the origami bot, when the ice dissolves, pops out. And then you can control it with a magnet. And apparently, this number blew my mind, apparently 3,500 people every year swallow those batteries, batteries. That, that you find in watches. And having a three and a half year old and a one year old, yeah. I'm guessing that they're all people under I five. I think it's mostly children, but probably it's some mostly uh, children. couple people with certain tastes. Sure, okay. Uh, and so what this robot does is like, so some, some percent of those 3,500 people end up with the battery lodged in part of their stomach. And they can't get it out, and then you have problems. If it passes, you're fine, but if it gets stuck, you have problems. So this robot goes in, opens up, and then you control it with a magnet. It connects to the battery. It yanks it out to dislodge it. And then it you know, passes with everything else and leaves naturally. Uh, and so we're hoping that, that that little robot never really develops the ability to consider its life objectively, because it, it might be a little depressed. But again, it's sausage casing. So yeah. it's going to dissolve away, and it's going to go away. So you don't have to worry about yeah. however it feels about things. Because uh, it'll be dead. Because it'll be dead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, so anyway, uh, that's, that's one use. But uh, Daniela is helping is hoping that first of all at some point you won't be able you won't have to like control it remotely it'll work on its own mm -hmm. uh, and then she's also working on other things like can you get these bots to deliver medicine to very particular areas and so she's thinking about the medical applications but you can also make these things big enough that it could be like a table that if someone's disabled the table you know puts itself together and then walks over to you so you don't have to go to it or a chair that can just fold up together and go to where it needs to go and so you can see that there can imagine lots of cool applications for that yeah. but uh, go ahead do do okay so the the sort of uh oh. Uh, so the, 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 the super advanced uh, paradigm that may never happen is, is called the bucket of stuff paradigm, which is something like this, uh, perhaps. Um, but, but the basic idea is it's kind of like having a T-1000, but it, it like fixes stuff in your house, or it, uh, <laughs> <laughs> instead of killing you. Um, or, or, you know, but if it's truly universal, it should be able to turn into anything. It could be a wrench. It could be a, a phone. Um, it could even be, you know, if you can command it, uh, uh, and it's, you know, on your side. Um, you know, you can you can just tell it to glob over and do something for you. Um, so there are a lot of problems with this paradigm, and, and the par uh, privacy thing is, is one issue that we'll probably get to in a little bit. Uh, but um, but yeah, there are a couple of people actually working on this. The big problem is the I think the smallest one was like a cubic centimeter. You have to have these little quote unquote atoms uh, that um, can move, can sense a little bit, can dock with each other. That's important. Um, and then after that, some of the stuff is like luxury. You, you might want a battery on board each one. Um, so miniaturizing this is a really tough problem. Um, and then get into the math thing a little bit. Uh, that's right now. That's right now. Oh, God. The time is uh, now. Yeah, so that we, 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 one of the really interesting things we found out is that one of the difficulties of building a T-1000 to serve you is the math. Uh, because um, I think the way we say it is if you imagine you have a, uh, a marching band that's got a shape from, say, a star into uh, like the university logo. And so you only have 100 people. That's not that hard a problem. Plus, each atom of that system has a human brain, so that helps. Um, 
but but yes, yeah, so it's not that hard a problem. But you imagine each time you add another individual, the problem doesn't just get one person harder, right? It scales. Uh, so if it's a thousand, that becomes a really hard problem. People knowing where to go, what to do if someone falls over. Um, and then if you scale up to you know ten thousand or a million, or I guess a T one thousand when I have a billion and they're in three dimensions, and and presumably there are all sorts of like physical constraints at each point, like you know along the equivalent of a bone, you have to all be docked with each other a certain way. What happens is calculating what everybody needs to do to like make your hand into a giant knife to kill uh, that that one guy in the movie. I, I shouldn't be talking about the T one thousand. You know way too yeah. little about that movie, um, also. <laughs> but uh, so if you want to do that, it's actually a pretty tough math problem, right? Is that you have to expend just the right amount of atoms. They all have to go to the right place. And crucially, if you really want to kill a human, they have to go fast. Um, so like, there's uh, a version, a super preliminary version of this called kilobots, which if you want to visualize it, it's like a little, almost the size of a watch battery canister with three little legs. And it just kind of moves by jiggling. Um, and they're called kilobots because the original system had 1,024 of them. Uh, and um, th not 1,000 because it's nerd town. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so 1,024 of these, and they, um, being aware of this sort of problem, they wanted it to have a relatively simple algorithm that each of them were using. And so they did get it to where they could shape like a wrench, like not one you could ever use, but like a three or a 2D shape of a wrench, and then change into, say, a star or something. The problem was, I think it was like it took six hours to go from one to the other. <laughs> they, yeah, so they had this really sort of simple perimeter crawling algorithm. Uh, and you know, again, if you, <laughs> you want to kill somebody or you know, have a phone instantly appear in your hand, um, and then have it kill somebody. Uh, uh, you're going to have a problem unless you solve this math problem. I don't know. It might not even be solvable, uh, or at least not solvable in the sense of getting a way to do it quickly uh, and properly. But yeah. But this audience can solve yeah, that problem. Twenty percent so, of your time to the robot yeah. murderer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So there, there are a lot of reasons why a bucket of stuff could be a problem. So an ideal <laughs> bucket of stuff would be able to become like a camera or a receiver, and it could transmit information. And if these get really tiny, you could imagine that it would be very easy to spy on someone. You know, you just put some of these in all the hotel rooms, and then you can spy on everyone and transmit that information anywhere. Uh, and then additionally, if you can get this bucket of stuff to look like anything, you could make it look like your clothes, and then you could bring it on a uh, flight, and then you could turn it into something more dangerous. And so presumably, you know, the TSA would be trying to keep the bucket of stuff out, but it's hard to know how they would be able to do something like that. Uh, and so then you talked about there's, there's privacy concerns, mm -hmm. and then there's patenting concerns. So if you have a bucket of stuff that can become anything, then why buy anything else? You can just <laughs> tell your bucket of stuff to become that thing. Uh, and so it's hard to know how that problem is going to be solved, although mm -hmm. 3D printing is sort of starting to deal with those problems now, uh, kind of. No, a little bit, yeah. Like, yeah. like there's this issue of can you 3D print a gun, mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's a tough one because it's like more importantly, like it's like people can't make gun laws if you can always 3D print a gun. Uh, mm -hmm. But and if you have programmable matter, it's like you have a permanent anything device that includes all sorts of banned things. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Well, then another problem is who is to blame when something goes wrong? <laughs> right. And of course, this is you know the self-driving car problem. If your self-driving car gets into an accident, who do you blame? And so there are proposals that you could use. You know, so the 4D printing stuff that we were talking about. So maybe you could use that to change the way airplane wings work depending on the speed that you're going at. Or maybe you could use it to change your tires depending on the conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, but what happens if one of those things goes wrong at the wrong moment and you die? Who's to blame for that? I, you know, is it the person who designed it? And so, anyway, these decisions, these sorts of problems, need to get worked out. Um, any other negatives that I'm? I think Scott Tibbetts talked about a sort of general negative of offloading our personal autonomy to like machines that just make decisions for us. Uh, we've already done that. Okay, <laughs> that's not a problem. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, they're, yeah. Uh, so no, I'm, I'm kidding, but. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, so then there's a number of different benefits if you had this kind of stuff. So one, presumably we could really cut down on waste. So if you had a bucket that could become anything, then you could own a lot less stuff because that bucket could become your wrench and your plunger. So you don't need a big toolkit. You've got this thing that could become anything. Uh, we already talked a little bit about how if you have stuff on your home that changes in response to ambient conditions, mm -hmm. you could maybe control internal conditions with very low energy input, uh, which we think is pretty exciting. Uh, then we talked about the programmable matter, like those little origami robots, which could help deliver medicine to very particular locations or dislodge batteries. Uh, anything else? Uh, any more awesomeness? Yeah. There's, there's, there's tons. I don't know. Mostly I want a toy origami thing. I don't know. I don't, you, yeah. Yeah. No, a toy <laughs> origami thing would be pretty awesome. Uh, uh, <laughs> there, there, thanks. <laughs> there was, there's this whole like, uh, so one version we don't really talk about in this talk, and I think is the swarm robots uh, version of how you might do this. I and mean, we kind of, it's, it's kind of related to how um, 
how uh, a T1000 would work. I keep coming back to that, but like, <laughs> you know, they're, they're like practical utilities to having like a large swarm of robots that can reconfigure with each other because if, if you want to say send a bunch of robots into a disaster zone, a swarm might be preferable to just one um, because if something breaks down, it would be okay. Uh, and also by being able to break apart and come back together, they can navigate a little more effectively. So we, we looked at one group is trying to design, it'd be something like you'd have 10 robots about this big and one of the tricks they could do is navigate through like, um, like a dip in the ground by latching onto each other. And so they had this really cute algorithm where one robot realizes there's a big dip and then it has, I think, I think on that one is a lighting system. So it signaled, hey, someone dock with me. And then the other robots would get the signal, they'd back up until they had a train of the appropriate size and then they could go over the gap. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are all sorts of similar things you can program in. Like they could effectively tightrope walk or at least cross a narrow passage by having two side by side going the right way. Um, we also, can I talk about the evolving robots thing? Uh, I know it's not germane to the talk, but it's a... Yeah, well, we, we got to get to that. All right, all right. Uh, so, so anyway, maybe at the end, someone yeah. can ask about that. Uh, so, but, but in general, if you have this swarm that can solve its own problems as, it's, as it goes, you can send it into hazardous areas like New Jersey and have it solve problems <laughs> and, and fix, you know, fix things. But to be honest, what we were most excited about was like, imagine you go to Ikea and you buy like that table and the table just unfolds itself and you don't have to put it together. That would save like a billion human hours <laughs> if you didn't have to put together your Ikea stuff. So um, we're gonna talk about the Nota Bene on how it will end for all of humanity. Yes. So we, were, we came across a lot of really awesome stories about human robot interactions that made us not particularly optimistic about humanity's ability to persist in the face of smart robots. <laughs> uh, so do you wanna talk about Promobot, Promobot. first? Uh, sure, sure. Um, so Promobot is just a, and I'm, I'm definitely pronouncing it wrong. It's it's a Promobot. Russian. I'm not gonna try. It. It's, it's a Russian robot company, uh, and this is this is just a little story. But it's cute. There's this robot, uh, and it's designed to be like a robot assistant. It can do things like uh, remember human faces and learn things about its environment, and it apparently keeps trying to escape. Uh, <laughs> so they had what was it two incidents where it like got out and like ran down the street to get yeah. away. Yeah, and it ran out of batteries in the middle of the road. So yeah. instead of helping the elderly, like I think it was supposed to be doing, it instead died in the middle of the street and stopped traffic. Uh, so we we need our robots to stop trying to escape because uh, yeah. they're not very helpful there. Uh, but then our favorite robot was named Gaia. So there was a, a Harvard undergrad named Serena Booth, and she wanted to know how much people trust robots. And so she lived in the dorms, and there, were, there are a number of different reasons why if you live in Harvard dorms, you shouldn't be letting anything or anyone into the dorms. So first of all, apparently, and this totally creeps me out, apparently at Harvard, tourists like to take photos of dorms. Like so the inside of them. The inside of dorms. Yeah. So they'll like come up to the dorm window, you're shaking your head, did that happen to you? Were you at Harvard? Just a lot of universities. Yeah, that. We have it at what the heck is wrong with people? <laughs> it, okay, so anyway, so they come up to the window and they put the camera up and they take a photo, right? So like people are trying to intrude on privacy all the time if you're in these dorms. Uh, and then additionally, the Harvard dorms had had bomb threats somewhat recently. So everyone had been written recently and told, do not let anyone into the dorms. They didn't specify no robots, but they probably assumed you shouldn't be letting anything in. And then finally, uh, there were a bunch of thefts. So the students knew you shouldn't be letting anyone to the dorms. So what, what Serena did is she created a robot that she could uh, operate remotely. So she was sitting at a table pretending to do her work, but she was really operating this robot. And it would come up to people first by themselves and say, hey, can you let me into the dorm? And I think something like 21% of the time they'd say yes. But usually they'd be like, no, you can't get in the dorms. But if the robot approached groups, 71% of the time they let it in. So <laughs> notes to any robots out there, humans are real dumb in groups. Yes. And then additionally, if she gave the robot cookies, yes. almost everyone let it in. Yeah. And, and so the, it was carrying a box from like a fancy local cookie chain, but it actually only had grocery store crummy snickerdoodle cookies in there. Yeah, and so good. apparently, yeah, for the price of like dollar snickerdoodles, people will put their entire dorm at risk <laughs> to let the cookies in. Uh, and do you want to talk about the emergency robots? I think or do you're you want more me? the expert on that one. Yeah. Okay, so uh, finally, there was a PhD student named Paul Robinette, and he was at Georgia Institute of Technology, and he wanted to know how much people would trust robots in an emergency situation. So first he started off with sort of like low stakes. There were some undergrads who thought they were doing a survey. So they came in and the robot brought them to the survey room and they did the survey and then the experimenters released smoke and set off the fire alarms. 
and a lot of the undergrads, instead of going out the door that they just came in, so like they knew how to get out of the building, followed the robot, which like, it. At first, we were like, well, that's weird. And then we watched the video, and it was really weird because that is a slow moving robot. Like, <laughs> it was just like crawling along. And so, okay, but it, gets, but it gets worse. Okay, so then they had a situation where the robot went to the wrong room and circled the wrong room and then went to the survey room. Again, moving real slow. And then they did the thing again. And still, most of the undergrads followed that robot instead of going out the door that they knew. And then finally, there was a last treatment with I think only six students, so it's a small sample size. But the robot went into a corner and started going like this, like, like this is where the survey the is. <laughs> uh, and an experimenter came out and said, I'm sorry, this robot is broken. They used the words, this robot is broken. <laughs> and then they went to a different room to do the survey and they set off the smoke alarm and some students followed it. And then I think, I think Paul was like, I'm just gonna see how far I can push this. Yeah. And so in one situation, he had the robot go to a room that was blocked by a couch. <laughs> All the lights were shut off and there was no exit sign. And the robot started pointing at the dark room. <laughs> and there were students who had to be retrieved eventually by the experimenters because they would not leave the robot. And so there's a, so, and, and, oh, so anyway, this blows my mind. So this robot looked really like, not, not human-like, it was a very dumb looking a slow robot. Paul wheels, did a great yeah. job, but it looks like a, a trash can on wheels. <laughs> so the point is, you don't need a T-1000 to trick humanity yeah. to their doom. Yeah. It just needs to be a trash can on wheels that's carrying cookies, <laughs> and humanity's in a lot of trouble. Yeah. And so if the robots ever rise up, we're, we're, we're done for, it, yeah. perhaps. Uh, but so anyway, that's just like a taste of one of the chapters in the book and one of the nota bene's that we did. Uh, we did 10 chapters, eight of which we've told you about. Uh, maybe we'll remember more <laughs> if you ask us a question about it. We only spent two years on this book. Asteroid mining. I said that. Shh. Yeah. I uh, synthetic biology and precision medicine. 10. Anyway, right, shouldn't have been so excited about that. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, that is the book, uh, and we, we hope you enjoy it, those of you who decide to read it, and we would be happy to answer questions now, so that if you want to line up at the microphone, oh, yes. uh, we would love to hear <laughs> what you would like to ask us about. Uh -oh. Or we can tell you about cheap access to space. No, no, we've got some humans. Okay. Hi. Is it on? Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but he's dressed right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which I make him do in public. No yeah. comment. So I, I pre-ordered the book and I and I finally received it yesterday and I accidentally received two book plates. So oh, if you want one back to give it to yeah, an, another we, yeah. eligible no, no, you can purchaser. Keep the sticker. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, actually, was uh, curious. I only got through the first chapter, and I was a little disappointed to see that the um, the space elevators were already in the first chapter because I was looking forward to that to uh, like the, the climax of the book. But do you talk about, in the, or could you talk about how some of these things interact? So, like the the bucket of goo or the bucket of stuff could also be used in the space. Uh, exploration, you wouldn't have to bring every possible tool. That, that's actually, I don't remember if we talked about that, but that was one of the things brought up. Like, actually, the space comes up surprisingly often in the book, and we were trying to figure out why. And I think our general realization was that, you know, space is also awesome. part of the universe. And well, yeah, so it's like you're, you're still going to need most of the same stuff once you're in space. Um, but yeah, you'll need it much more efficiently. Um, so I, I think we, we talk a little about, there, there's a little section in the book on 3D printed food, which they care about for space, kind of for the same reason. It's like efficient food packing mechanism. Um, we talk a little bit about repooping, where they're trying to figure out how to reuse no, feces uh, yeah. and turn it back into food and 3D print food. But the, the, the best but they're part very about efficient. The, the, the project yeah, about exactly. using feces. That face is the right to, face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the project uh, about using human waste uh, to feed humans contains the phrase closing the loop. Uh, <laughs> which I feel like give, gives you an insight into food scientists. They're like, we need to solve this. Yeah, not, you know? not all loops. It's gone to be on closed. too long. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sorry, did I answer your question? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It went in a weird tangent, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> this is a question just for Zach. Are you intentionally low key cosplaying Shaggy? Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh... I'm embarrassed. Oh, she left. 
She didn't have another question. Like, I thought she was going to say uh, Yeah, that, that, that no, was more like, of an assertion a than a question. Yeah. I like your shirt, by the way. So what was the thing you wanted to talk about with the evolution yeah. of the robots? With the what? The Roombots that evolved. Oh, go ahead. So, OK, so this is this. Um, so remember, we talked about like how there's a one centimeter version of the, the bucket of stuff paradigm. There's a, there's a slightly more currently plausible version called Roombots. Um, which is totally worth looking up. Uh, you, I use the search engine called Alta Vista. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, <laughs> um, we're talking at the one guy at Alta Vista next. That's our next stop. Uh, <laughs> um, no, but so there's these, these robots you can kind of visualize like a thing about this big that's really two hemispheres. They're, they're not like, it's not literally spherical. It's kind of like between a, a sphere and a cube. But they can, why they do that is so that an individual one can kind of roll along. And all they do, they can detect things, they can transmit and receive signals, and they can dock. And so, um, so uh, the, the idea with it is, is you basically have these little things that can roll around, stick to each other, and they can turn into like, it's called Roombots because the idea is to make furniture. Um, so for example, you could have like 20 of these, they make the legs of a table, and then one literally would go grip a tabletop maybe, and then just sort of carry it up because uh, they can climb walls that have the appropriate gripper type uh, and form a table. and then. Best of all, the table could walk over to you. Um, probably would roll over to you, but if you could get it to walk, that'd be really cool. Um, and so the nice idea with this uh, is, is you, it'd be good for like elder care, uh, for people who, who, who can't do for themselves as well as others. Uh, but there's this really cool project, and I don't think, I don't know if this has been done in, uh, in, in real life, has been done in simulations. But you know, the way genetic algorithms work, right, is you, you, you would say to say a, a pile of Roombots, configure somehow and go as fast as you can across the room. And then you could, uh, once having done that, you can, you can mutate it. And so people tried this. Uh, and so it's like, what's really cool is you've, you can create a system that's in real life made of these individual robots. And you can tell them, hey, mutate based on your last uh, couple, couple versions that worked. And maybe you, you arrive at new design configurations that you hadn't thought of, which is just kind of neat. Because uh, it's, like, it's like genetic algorithms, but they're actually having to interface with reality instead of uh, a simulation, which is, I don't know, to me, that's really cool. So now we have to talk about the swarm morph video. Swarm morph. So, so there was another yeah. group that was doing genetic algorithms to try to get uh, their like similar blocks to solve problems. And we did not think that this was necessary at all. But someone directed us to a video where before they would try a new configuration, they would come together. And then they would like rub against each other for a while as yeah. though they were mating. And we were, and this went on for like 25 seconds. And we were. <laughs> That's right. It sounded like some like administration person had said, make them mate, and they had just taken it too literally. Right. Yeah. And, and, so, and then they'd essentially just send directions to a 3D printer. So it was not at all necessary. <laughs> it was not a necessary component of the process. But it still did it anyway. Yeah. We, we took great joy That's, in watching that video. That, yeah. yeah, yes. Anyway, or someone, I erased that. I don't know. Was, well, I'll never forget. <laughs> Uh, thank you both for coming. Huge fan of the comic strip. Thank you. Um, fairly often, uh, there's a, an extra, I guess, bonus comic panel mm -hmm. that appears when you hover over the votey button. I, yes. I assume this has some historical import. Um, Very much so. Uh, and uh, actually, fairly often in that pop-up panel, it, it shows Kelly disapproving, often holding one of your children who's yeah. also disapproving uh, <laughs> of the contents of the comic strip. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the, the collaborative aspects. You know, does she <laughs> review every comic uh, with there be even more offensive jokes if uh, if she wasn't there <laughs> backstopping you? That's a good question. Well, you know, now and then, so I always send Kelly my jokes, and she makes notes on them. And now, now and then there's one I think is really good and that you, like, hate. Uh, and so I, I always do those. Uh, <laughs> she does. Because, uh, because if, it, if it does well, it's just like such a like win in the marriage. Uh, and and the, the single-use monocles was the, the number one example of that. I was like, that project's never going to work. They, they may not know stupid. what it is. Yeah. And he sold tons of them. Go we, ahead. We sold them in 25 packs. Of, so if you don't know, if you go to singleusemonocles.com, it's a real thing you can actually buy. It's, a, it's like a wrapper uh, with one monocle. I still don't get it. <laughs> I don't get it. But I'm glad about the money it brought yeah. in. So that's so that this is the nice thing when that when it's a project like this. So I might lose, but we make money and yeah. that's fine. So I kinda I'd rather win. Actually there's no <laughs> there's no price that I that's as important as winning. Yeah. But uh, but it's all right. The, the money brings me some solace. Yeah. But what's interesting yeah. is that uh, I have met people who have expected me to be super grumpy yeah. and not a happy person, and that is not me at all. I'm actually Why? very. Uh, <laughs> 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 I'm actually. 
<laughs> I'm actually very upbeat. Yeah. Uh, and anyway, people expect me to be kind of grumpy, and I'm, I don't think I'm that grumpy, but maybe I am. Who knows? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you again both for coming. Um, just out of curiosity, you know, I wonder what the process was starting with a fan base that was formed from single use monocles, there once was a man from Shkamanaria, touch him on the penis style yeah. jokes, yeah. and transitioning them, in, which I've loved and got me into your comic many, many years ago, and transitioning them into much more science and, yeah. and theory and intelligence. Did you find any friction there, or what was the thought process going from that yeah. style of humor to this? Yeah, yeah, so the, uh, I, yeah, so, um, Part of it was just, um, well, part of it was probably just maturing a bit, but also just. Uh, <laughs> Boo. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, but uh, I, I think I mistakenly thought on the internet, if you got nerdy, people didn't like it too much. Like, I tried to keep it a little, like, don't want to send people to Wikipedia. And it just turns out totally wrong. Um, uh, it seemed like the, the dorkier the comic got, the more sizable the audience became. So I kind of just kept going in that direction. And I don't know, also, I just, I, as I got to do it full time, I just had more time to read and uh, get well up on things, and, and that's been helpful. So yeah, I mean, but what's nice is I've had a lot of people say like, you know, I started reading your comic in high school, and it's sort of grown with me. Uh, so that's been very gratifying. Yeah. Thank you. With everything that's about to ruin everything, how do we prepare the next generation to survive? Mm. How do we prepare them to survive? I, I think they're just doomed, and you just yeah, that's that. Just let them go. Uh, I don't, I, do you just teach them that privacy doesn't matter? Because that's, <laughs> that's something they're going to have to deal with. Yeah. Uh, We're not at Facebook. You shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Lol. Lol. Uh, I don't have a good answer for that. What do yeah, you I get, it would be kind of topic dependent. So you know, there, there are 10 different topics, and kind of each presents issues. So she mentions privacy, which um, we talk about a bit more extensively in a chapter on brain-computer interfaces, which are kind of like the, the final end of privacy, right? Because now we can extract you know, brain states from a computer, but... Uh, oh, no, you got to go into more detail. Do you want me to go into more detail? Sure, yeah. Okay, so, so the apparent... So we brain-computer interfaces are little machines that talk to your brain, and they have, you know, they read your brain waves, and they figure out what it is you're thinking and what you want to do. And right now, they're being used to, like, make prosthetics that will, like, reach out and grab the thing you're thinking about reaching out and grabbing. And we thought that the end goal was to, like... <laughs> make it so that someone who is a quadriplegic could have all their abilities back and you know just by thinking about it they could do they could do anything and so that's the answer i expected when i asked gerwin shock what is the end goal of brain computer interfaces and his answer was one day all of our brain all of our thoughts will be able to get uploaded to one cloud and will become one big super organism that shares all of our thoughts and i was like that is horrible like i don't i don't our marriage works cuz that doesn't happen and so like and i think that's why society works yeah. in general and so he 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 admitted that there could be negatives to that he's like you know so if you're sitting on the couch and you think i want to leave my wife she would know that, and, that, and he, he said, and that wouldn't be so great. And I was like, that would absolutely not be so great. And so, so anyway, it, this is like the ultimate end of privacy if that ever happens. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, it is fascinating to think about. Like, humans are a totally different thing if all of our brains are connected like that. Like, it's, anyway, it's, it's crazy, but we personally kind of hope that future never comes never to pass. Happens, no. And then I asked other people in the brain-computer interface world, is this actually, was, is this just Gerwin? Or does everybody know that this is the end goal, but like in interviews you just talk about like <laughs> being able to move your arm if you couldn't before. And they're like, well yeah, you know, in the interviews we talk about the arm thing, but like at the conference we all know that we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna upload our brain to the cloud. And I was like, we need to stop funding yeah. this field. And I'm, I'm very sorry for the amputees, but yeah. like, <laughs> but no, that's, anyway. That's gonna get quoted somewhere. <laughs> oh, I hope <laughs> That would be very bad. Um, you anyway, know, so no, it's funny. So I was, I was just talking at Google Seattle, and somebody brought up, what if there's like, instead of one, there's like three, and now there's like the three roommate problem. You know, there's like three super brains. I'm not and following. Like, when like two are more down with each other than the other super brain. You oh, know? <laughs> got it. <laughs> All right, well, so anyway, uh, uh, so privacy, they really need to not care about privacy if the future is going to work for yeah. them. Yeah, because we're all going to be one big super brain. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, I've been reading SMBC since I had to load it up on a dial-up modem. Oh, my God. Uh, what bought? And that was a big deal because black and white comics loaded a lot faster. Mm -hmm. uh, that's right. Way and uh, <laughs> I just was curious what your favorite comic was. My favorite of mine? I don't know. I kind of go through phases. Uh, probably one of the long story ones or something, but I don't, I don't really have a favorite. I, I like XKCD. Yeah. <laughs> Can I? I'm not grumpy. I can have a nice I, uh, personality. 
can I ask about the uh, giraffe hooker? The giraffe hooker. Oh, uh, for those who don't know, there's a. <laughs> That's a good start to that. Um, <laughs> This is in reference to, I think there's an XKCD where he made a, a joke about, I, I don't actually remember what the context was, but the clear implication was that I needed to draw a sexy giraffe uh, as a bonus panel. You're not aware of this. <laughs> no, I forgot. Yeah. I, um, so if you want to see a sexy giraffe, I'm one of your options. Um. <laughs> it's funny. In, so in grad school, a lot of, so I, so I was a faculty at Rice for a while, and a lot of the people I'd encounter, I'd be like, oh, my husband's a cartoonist, and everyone was like, oh, is it the XKCD guy? I'd be like, no, 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 the PhD comics guy. The PhD comics No, guy. not that either, the SMBC guy. And then they just and walk they, away. Oh, yeah. no, 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 they, that worked plenty of times. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks yeah. for your question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I find it inspirational that you're you're able to have uh, a relationship where the two of you can be so collaborative and creative. Um, I was wondering if you had any tips. When I, when I, <laughs> when I uh, try to collaborate, we always uh, like tips to avoid ending up on each other's nerves or avoid mm -hmm. having one person taking ownership of the project. Uh. Uh, well, uh, so the, the background is that when we started dating, our favorite thing to do was spend all day in the library and then go on walks and talk about what we had learned. And so our relation, aw. And so, so our relationship started as like, we like to go on walks and talk about stuff. And so this project, essentially the topic that we talked about on our walks yeah. was always soonish. And so we were just, anyway, it was kind of nice to know we were talking about different papers we had read on the same topic. And anyway, so that worked well. But additionally, we got kind of lucky because our personalities are such that we wanted to tackle different parts. Mm -hmm. So I did all of the interviews. Uh, he did a lot of the background reading, although some of the chapters, that was me doing the background reading. Mm -hmm. um, he, he's the funny one. And so he did uh, the jokes and the comics. Yeah. Uh, and then I am the detail-oriented one. So I went through every single sentence in this book and made sure we had a citation for every single sentence. This was when we, we didn't actually think that we were going to write a bibliography, which yeah. was real dumb of us to not expect that was going to happen. Yeah. And then Ginny, who's here, was like, oh, hey, guys, your bibliography. And I was like, ugh. <laughs> so, so I went through every sentence and made our bibliography. But, yeah. And that was something that would have killed Zach. Yes, yeah, I, don't, I would have cried a lot. Yeah. He, would, he would have cried. And so, yeah. so I guess, to be honest, we, we got lucky that we're interested in diff different parts of it yeah. uh, and that we really just like talking about nerdy stuff for a long time and sending chapters back and forth. It's really important to not get your feelings hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, mean, I feel like in any collaboration, that's really important. But it's particularly important when it's your spouse who's yeah. like, no, 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 we have to trash. The synthetic biology chapter you wrote is junk. We've got to start over again. Yeah. And so you really need to like have a thick skin, yeah. um, which we both do. Neither one of us cares what the other one thinks. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> it's really important. It's yeah. really important. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Do you have a, another answer I, for I'm just working gonna, Just groups? a little thing to add to that. Yeah, like I, I do a decent amount of collaborating, and sometimes it goes well, and sometimes it doesn't. And the two things um, that are really important is, um, one, you have separate magisteria as much as possible. You have separate roles. And in your domain, you have like more veto power, or if not absolute veto power. And the other thing, and this is hard to know in advance, is like if, if the person you're working with communicates well, that makes a big difference, because people who don't communicate well end up sort of storing up their anger and then releasing it on you at some point. And I, you know, so, so if you have like a relatively mature person uh, who talks about when they're having a problem and doesn't just try to tough it out, that can, that can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. One of the previous questions reminded me that one, my favorite SMBC comic is the one about how it takes seven years to master a new skill, and that yeah. leads to many lifetimes. And you could be an artist and a writer and a. Mm -hmm. So, can you talk about the lifetimes you've had and where that idea came oh, from? Oh man, the actually it was, it was specific, perhaps some of you have read. There's a somewhat famous speech by um, Hamming from I think 1986 that that um, sort of talks about. It. It's actually written for for programmers uh, about like how you're going to have your career. Um, and so he talked about a kind of a related concept. He talked about how he liked switching fields a lot. And I, I think, I mean, he was, he was a pretty nerdy guy, so I think he was talking about switching from software to hardware. He wasn't talking about like becoming a poet. Um, but, but I found that idea really interesting, and I, you know, to, to keep you from going stale. Um, so this, this project is kind of one of those. Um, and another one we started doing five years ago is called BaFest, uh, the Festival of Bad Ad Hoc Hypotheses, which gives you a pretty good sense of how nerdy it is. Um, which uh, we, we ha was and remains a pretty big challenge. It's a live event, um, which is it's sort of an improv game, I guess. I'd say it's, it's like fake science talks that you have to defend against like actual scientists, um, <laughs> right? Um, 
And uh, um, so, yeah, I kind of, I, I, you know, it's funny. Every time we do a project like this, at some point I have the same thought, which is why didn't I just keep writing comics? Uh, <laughs> um, but, yeah, so I, I, I try to, um, on the regular, do something that, like, makes me really uncomfortable. I, I don't, you know, uh, I don't quite have the luxury to completely switch careers at any moment because, you know, we have babies and babies like to eat. Um, and, uh, but, but, yeah, I try to regularly do a new experiment. So another one I'm doing... <clears throat> Probably in 2019, I have a, this has already been announced, so I can, it's not uh, private info. I, I'm doing a project with a guy named Brian Kaplan, who's an economist about, um, sort of, I don't want to give away too much, I guess, but it's, it's sort of like a nonfiction pro immigration graphic novel trying to explain some statistics and stuff. Um, so that has been a totally different challenge because I'm just the illustrator on it. I, uh, I can chat a little with him about stuff, but mostly I'm just illustrating his words. Um, so that's been a completely different challenge for me. Um, so yeah, I guess it, what I try to say is you, you should do something that makes you feel stupid at least like once every two years. Um, yeah, yeah, it's very important. It's very important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So I feel like maybe you kind of just answered my question, uh -oh. but I guess what I was going to say is you, you know you're both really great communicators on complex Thank you. Uh, issues and complex topics, and I was wondering if like you thought you might move more in a direction of like public advocacy or public information, which it kind of sounds like. You already maybe are a little bit? A little bit. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm also working on another comic project I shouldn't say too much about, but about sort of explaining um, like political norms, which suddenly people are very interested in, like uh, what do things used to be like. Um, but like um, a little bit more, although I, I really do enjoy fiction and, and like storytelling, so I don't want to get too far away from that. Uh, but, but yeah, I do. It's, it, part of the nice thing about having a job explaining stuff is you get to learn stuff all day long, which is a pretty good deal. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, sometimes it gets a little, little thick, but, uh, but most of the time it's pretty awesome. So for us, it's kind of a lifestyle choice, I guess. One thing that was also nice about working as a team is that one of us would start doing the background research, mm -hmm. would write a draft, and then we'd send it to the other one. And so sometimes when you get too thick into something, it's easy to write it and forget what you didn't know when you started. Mm -hmm. But so if the other person comes at it fresh, they can tell you where you haven't explained something clearly. And so we tried to work the chapters like that. And so that's one yeah. way we tried to make everything clear, which hopefully we did well. Yeah. Oh yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, Kelly, I'm curious about what some of the other ideas Zach's have that you thought were the worst ones. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, that made it in the book? that I thought were particularly bad? Either ones that did or didn't. Uh, well, so one of, the, one of the really interesting things about writing this book was that I went from thinking some technologies were just awesome across the board to thinking they were awesome but also kind of scary. So asteroid mining, for example, uh, first of all, that one we were totally wrong about what asteroid mining was. We thought the ideal was to, to like go out, get tungsten, bring it to Earth, and now have a ton of tungsten that you can sell on Earth. But it turns out economically that just doesn't work because you're going to bring a ton of tungsten here, you're going to crash the market, and then that was a waste of billions and billions of dollars. And so the point now is you go out there, you get the tungsten, you build a space base, and then you go and explore you know, the world. Or you bring it to the space station, you get water from the asteroids, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, so we became really excited about cheap access to space and asteroid mining. But the scary thing is, once you get the ability to wrangle asteroids and you can bring them anywhere, you can also fling them at the Earth, which mm -hmm. would, could be worse than any nuclear bomb we've ever set off. And so, like, when people get cheap access to space, for example, if the space elevator works, we suddenly will have tons and tons of people in space, maybe we'll have colonies on Mars, and you'll suddenly have people with the ability to be able to move giant objects and fling them at Earth, potentially. And so it's a great technology, but now you have to trust that human beings aren't horrible. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if our history <coughs> totally warrants that. And so it's a little bit scary. It's an awesome technology that now has something that could be really negative. And a lot yeah. of these technologies are like that. So our book originally had uh, advanced nuclear reactors, uh, fission reactors. And that's another technology where it's like, well, if you can trust everyone, then that's great, because we have this greenhouse gas problem that we want to get rid of. We don't, you know, climate change is obviously a bad thing we're all dealing with right now. But can you trust people with it? Hard to say. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. OK, great. Thanks. Thanks. Anything else? Anything else? OK. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah.